Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm Christopher Brown. With just days, if not hours, remaining until the Saskatchewan provincial election on October 28th, we're diving deep into the status of the race, the key issues shaping voter sentiment, and what the parties are doing in these final hours to secure their base and sway those all-important undecided voters. This election has been anything but ordinary. We've seen an intense battle between the long-governing Saskatchewan party led by Premier Scott Moe and the resurgent NDP under Carla Beck's leadership. That means, as we inch closer to Election Day, both parties are making their final pushes to capture those all-important swing voters. Polling suggests this election could be a toss-up. But there are battleground ridings that could decide the ultimate victor, particularly in those urban centres like Regina, Saskatoon, Prince Albert, and yes, even Moose Jaw. Today, we'll be asking the critical questions. Are voters in the province looking for change, or are they content with the status quo? Have key issues like health care, affordability, and Saskatchewan's resource-based economy dominated the conversation enough to shift momentum in these final days? And how is each party trying to manage the urban-rural divide, which remains a key fault line in Saskatchewan politics. We'll also explore some of the moments that have stood out in this campaign. Was there any defining moment, perhaps in the leaders' debate, and truly swaying those public opinions? And what about voter engagement? Are we seeing signs of apathy? Or are people gearing up for a major turnout on Monday? To help us unpack all of this, I'm thrilled to be joined by Dale Richardson, principal of Earns Cliff Strategies and editor of The Scoop, a top source for political analysis in the province of Saskatchewan. Dale has been watching this election closely, and there's no one better to break down the strategies, the surprises, and the key dynamics that will define the final hours of this campaign. Attention Saskatchewan. This election season, Municipal Affairs is hitting the road in partnership with SUMA for the Saskatchewan Provincial Election. Join us on election night for live coverage straight from Regina on YouTube featuring exclusive insights from municipal leaders and stakeholders across the province. We will be capturing their reaction to the results and be diving into what the new provincial government means for municipalities. Plus, this fall, we will be traveling across Saskatchewan to hear directly from local leaders about the issues that matter most to you. Plus, this fall, we will be traveling across Saskatchewan starting September 30th to hear directly from local leaders like yourself about the issues that matter most. This is your election covered like never before. Municipal Affairs, your trusted voice from the grassroots to the government. Dale, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Uh, We have a lot to unpack because this is the last 72 hours as of this interview being aired of the Saskatchewan provincial election. Looking back on the last three and a half weeks, what's your state of the race heading into the final days of this campaign? Uh, Thanks, Chris, and and great to be here with you. Nice to to see you. Uh, I mean, first of all, it's felt both fast and slow at the same time this camp campaign i mean for people like me and others that have worked in politics we kind of hope that uh that elections happen faster than they actually do and then by the time the last week uh rolls around people are kind of biting their nails waiting for the results and you know hoping things that hurry up uh i i think as the race gets towards the end here it, it the the sense that i'm picking up the, the kind of vibe is that it's going to be uh not you know i don't think that the ndp is going to surge to victory but it's definitely going to be a close election uh certainly closer than than what saskatchewan residents have seen in the past uh and for sure for the last three three to four elections um is it, yeah the the ndp at least in the, these last days they're they're throwing everything that they can at the SAS party to to try and make a final push. And uh, I think people are, I mean, if they are seeing things, uh, which is a whole other discussion to have in this election, uh, they're probably seeing the NDP pushing really hard. So 
I was just recently in Saskatchewan for the first two weeks of the campaign, crisscrossing more rural areas of the province. And one of the things that I noticed, and it was in the first two weeks, and I know traditionally the first two weeks are usually the sleeper weeks in campaigns. There was an apathy uh, within the rural parts of the province because some residents were telling me that we're going to vote for the Saskatchewan party because that's where who's going to win no matter what we do. Some people saying they're not even going to go to the polls, but it's a foregone conclusion. Heading into the last two weeks and last two weeks of the campaign after Thanksgiving, did it start to pick up or is that apathy still around? Good question. I mean, ultimately, um, if the parties are seeing that or feeling that, they're going to have to push uh, you know, they, they know where their supporters are, where the, where the people are that they can count on. So it's ultimately up to them to go and get those people out to vote, even if people are telling them, oh, I mean, you guys are going to win anyway. What's the point? Why should I go to the ballot box? So uh, any any serious political party that that has an operation, uh, you know, worth their salt, they're going to go and get those people and drag them out to vote. Um, yeah, it, but it is, I, I mean, especially for, for, for the Saskatchewan party, that's like any party, that's a concern if you're hearing that, um, you know, particularly where in constituencies where the South party is going to be, uh, very strong, but, but even more so in the constituencies where, uh, where they're, they're fighting the NDP, you know, kind of in, in a nice fight. And they need those people to get out and vote uh, even even more so. Uh, you know, most of those constituencies are going to be in the cities and yeah. Regina, Saskatoon, Prince Albert, uh, and, and Moose Jaw in particular. Um, but yeah, no, there. If people are feeling that still, um, they the Sask Party they need to go and they need to grab those people as soon as they can. Usually a campaign is defined by an issue. There's usually that issue that is over-encompassing federally. It's affordability right now. Was there a key issue or multiple issues that were prominent in this campaign? Because when I watched the leaders debate, I was watching to see what potential themes are coming out. And there was not really a clear message of what this election is being fought on. The NDP wanted to be changed. The Saskatchewan party wanted to be status quo, but is that a uh, an election message to win on? Well, for the NDP, it, it could be in theory. Change is always, you know, particularly when you're running against a long-term government, like, like the Saskatchewan party changes can be quite compelling to people, but that party also needs to prosecute it effectively. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, it depends on each person's perspective. Some people will think that her the back in the interview that they, they really prosecuted that message of change very well. And others, um, you know, maybe some people that watched that the debate didn't really know Carl, uh, Carla back maybe came away from that thinking, ah, you know, I was really hoping to, to see something from her and I, I just didn't get it, which is something that uh, some people in, in my uh, world told me and they're not Saskatchewan party people or like really political types. So I thought that feedback was interesting. Um, besides that, you know, I think that there's been some common themes uh, and issues. One is affordability. Both the main two main parties really, talk quite a bit about that. I, I think that 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 the Saskatchewan party probably uh, had the edge on affordability in this campaign, to be honest, and maybe surprise uh, some watcher, political watchers in the NDP in terms of how focused they were uh, in their campaign on affordability, particularly with the new measures that, that they announced. I think the first 10 days of the campaign, the premier, uh, Scott Moe, I think, every announcement he made was was related to affordability or, or, or cost of living, which for years now has been the number one issue in, in the province. So um, I think if, if he had come in, if Mo would come into this campaign and not, uh, not addressed affordability and said, nothing to see here, everything's fine, don't worry about it. It's not a, this is not a huge issue of concern for people, then uh, I think he for sure would have been raked over the coals pretty hard for that. Uh, it was painted as out of touch. 
but to his credit and to his party's credit, they I think they put together a pretty solid plan uh, for cost of living uh, and affordability. The other kind of main theme or main issue uh, has been healthcare, uh, as as it always is. The NDP, in particular, in the last several days of this campaign, Chris, they've uh, I've really seen them pivot more towards healthcare. Their new TV ad that they just launched. Uh, features Carla Beck talking about healthcare. They've had a, several news releases in a row where that was their main push, or you know that was th- their message of the day during the campaign for several days in a row. Uh, so they really, it's have I guess have seen that as their main uh, key key talking point going forward, which is, is that, interesting because so, so, all- so just I just want to interject there for a second. Is that yep. because they saw what happened in New Brunswick and they saw what happened in Manitoba? Because Susan Holt, Wab Canoe both won on that healthcare message. They both defeated PC governments. I know the Saskatchewan party is not a PC government, but they are more on that spectrum. Do you, yeah. is, is there it, Was their focus shift because of what they saw other provincial party leaders potentially winning the, their elections on? So maybe we can win on this as well. I, I can't say EB and Rustad because... We still don't know what the election results are there. Um, yeah. And I mean, maybe um, most campaign strategies or campaign plans don't, don't rely on what may happen in another province's election, which happens at the same time. Um, but I mean, healthcare is a, it, it is a top issue for voters, regardless of if, you know, regardless of whether there's an election um, people, the other thing that maybe came into into account is that with inflation continuing to go down uh, in, in Saskatchewan last month, it was, I think, 0.7 percent. Perhaps people are now or maybe the NDP was seeing it in their research and they're polling that actually people are might be still concerned about cost of living, but they're seeing inflation keep going down. They're feeling maybe a bit better about their, you know, household finances. Yeah, for sure, groceries are staying the same, but maybe there's not quite the pressure that there was in the last in the last year, two or three years ago. Um, but healthcare, that's that's still something that people that they're picking up on is people have major concerns about. Going back to the leaders' debate for a second. Um Leaders debate can often change the dynamics of any campaign. Looking back at the 2011 campaign uh, federally with Jack Layton and Michael Ignatieff and Stephen Harper on the ballot, uh, Jack Layton accused uh, Michael Ignatieff of not showing up. Going back original to the 1984 campaign between Mulroney and Turner, you had an option, sir. That changed the dynamics of the campaign. Looking at it from an uh, insider's perspective, as someone who's watched this campaign unfold, did the debate change the narrative of the campaign, or was it steady as she goes? Oh, it was pretty close to a non-event, to be honest, Chris. Um, and that's not really because I think that either of the two leaders won. In in, in fact, uh, neither of them won, neither of them lost. There were no knockout punches thrown or, or or landed from either side, and I think that it, it, it was seen as a non-event even for those campaigns because the next day uh, both of the leaders they they were they were having press conferences and basically moving on completely from the debate. There was no kind of continued spin of Carla Beck won this debate. She's now the front runner. Scott Moe won the debate. He's He's still in the capward seat. Um, there were really no moments that stood out like that. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was kind of a non-event. Which, and again, kind of coming back to a little thing I said earlier is uh, who is who is seeing who watched the debate is another question I have. Who was seeing it in the first place or seeing the clips that came out of it? You know, in in the day that we live in, where social media is so prominent there wasn't that one you know clip that people watched on tiktok or instagram or uh, god forbid on twitter or x um so no i I don't think it was a huge event did did social media play a role in this campaign because looking from an outsider's perspective 
it didn't seem like they were engaging in the platforms that more Alberta, Manitoba, Ontario politicians use because Saskatchewan's always been a place where that face-to-face contact has always been the top priority for them. And social media hasn't really played a factor. Did it play a factor this election, do you think? Or is it still that face-to-face connections that most people rely on? Face-to-face is how you get people out to vote for you, right? Like Candidates in the various constituencies, there's a reason why people come and knock on on my front door and ask me to vote for them. If, you know, then they can see me face to face and say, oh, Dale's going to vote for me or no, this guy, this guy hates me. Uh, And then they move on. Um, But no, we are we are very much in a social media digital world to the point where I I mean, Chris, you're you're doing it with this show, with this podcast. Um, the the traditional media, I, I've been rolling around this idea that we maybe have just gone through the last um, traditional media first Saskatchewan election campaign to the point where um, I wonder in the 2028 campaign, is everything going to be media first in the sense of we're going to have a press conference to announce that uh, you know that that the Saskatchewan party is reducing taxes or that the NDP they're going to uh, increase surgeries uh, and we kind of saw glimpses of that in this campaign where uh, at least the SAS party and Scott Moe they would put out a a video announcement or they put up a video of the premier announcing that day's campaign commitment and they did that at you know, at least a full uh, a full hour before he had the press conference with media. Uh, so I I mean, it's where people are seeing things these days. It's on their phones, right? Like we're totally obsessed and committed with these with these devices. Um, people are not watching TV news as much as they as they used to. Um, there's you know, new local newspapers are this far from being totally dead. And for those that are not watching them, I, I'm. You know, it's very small uh, gap between my fingers. Like uh, the post. Just on just on that note alone, I've seen an increase of Saskatchewan listeners to this show because of the content that we've been putting out there of the municipal leaders that we talk to across the province during our two weeks journey throughout the province. So the traditional, and I hate to say the mainstream media because I think they still do have a place for our society, but. People aren't tuning in because they, if they don't watch it at the exact moment, they don't see it, right? So they're turning into those YouTubes, those TikToks that you would want. So I, I would imagine that Saskatchewan's changing just like every other province. For sure, for sure, and it, I, I mean, in some ways, we we are a bit behind compared to some other provinces, but and that's just the nature of Saskatchewan. We're just a little bit delayed on some stuff. Um, and it's nothing wrong. It's just, it's just the state of it, but yeah, no, I, I, I think that, um, most political parties, I think maybe not being critical of them. I think it's just the case. The NDP is, uh, is, is a bit behind the Saskatchewan party in, in terms of digital, uh, digital media and digital production and digital strategy. I think that is mostly due j- just to resources uh, the NDP just doesn't have as much money as the SAS party does. They don't have the staff to to really do the work in terms of that. But um, but but that could change in this next term if, if the NDP picks up a number of seats. And I should do a shameless plug here because uh, you we've been working together over the last few weeks and every episode of the Municipal Affairs. If you want to stay up to date on what's going on in Saskatchewan politics, Post-election, head over to the Scoop Political Briefing newsletter at the scoop.ca. I just want to make sure I got that right here. Yes, .ca. That's the S-K-O-O-P dot C-A. And get your essential insights delivered directly to your inbox every weekday morning. And Dale is the editor of that. And uh, it was very much appreciated during my travels across the province in Saskatchewan. So head over to the scoop.ca and check out that newsletter and get it delivered for to stay up to date on all your essential Saskatchewan politics uh, needs after this election, because it's probably going to be fun after the next three days and heading into cabinet shuffles and 
of the speech from the throne. So head over to the scoop.ca and check that out. But I want to talk about the next three days because that is going to be a big thing for these parties. Where is the Saskatchewan party going to need to focus to potentially win this election? Because there is an urban rural divide within the province of Saskatchewan right now. And if they want to win, they're going to have to pick up some seats in the two largest cities. So where are they going to be focusing, do you think? Well, they're going to be focusing in, in uh, Saskatoon, uh, definitely, Prince Albert and, and Moose Jaw. Uh, the, the campaigns in Regina are still going full blast. Unfortunately, I, I think at this point, there's not too many seats that are still in play for the SAS party in in Regina. Um, but, but in Saskatoon, I think that they are in better shape. And the Premier uh, Scott Moe, he spent a lot of time in Prince Albert during this campaign. There's only two seats there, um, but it's it's close to to his home constituency. Uh, Ross and Shelbrook kind of surrounds uh, the city of Prince Albert to the west and to the southwest of the city, and then uh, uh, and and then Moose Jaw. There's two seats as well in in, in that community. Uh, one I think is relatively safe, Moose Jaw North. Uh, Tim McLeod, he's a cabinet current cabinet minister. I think he's in good shape there. But uh, Musha Wakamo, that's another constituency that that's important. So yeah, PA and and uh, and Musha, not a ton of seats, but you know it could uh, it could make things a lot easier if if the South Party holds at least one in each of those two, two cities for sure. And what about the Saskatchewan NDP? Because they've been working hard to close that gap between the Saskatchewan party and themselves. And I, I hate to mention polls, but I'm going to have to a little bit. We see some polls that say the Saskatchewan party is ahead by five. We see some polls where the Saskatchewan NDP are, or sorry, the Saskatchewan NDP are ahead by five and the Saskatchewan party is ahead by five. So it, it's a toss up. And most of their support, the Saskatchewan NDP, is coming from Saskatoon, Regina, and those larger urban centers, Prince Albert, Moose Jaw. Where do they focus? Because to win this for them, they're going to have to run the the sort of Moose Jaws, the Prince Alberts, the Battlefords, Saskatoon and Regina and pick up one seat in the out of the two north. And I think it's Athabasca that they would have to pick up as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, the map for the NDP is a lot harder um, just with the kind of natural political leanings of the province. They the NDP will just they won't be competitive in a, in a number of uh, in a number of the of the of the rural constituencies and in fact they'll likely finish third in in a number of them uh which will be interesting to talk about after the campaign but no you're, you're right they they need to they need to win every seat in regina they need to pick up uh several more seats in saskatoon uh which will in my opinion be tough because uh there's a couple of incumbent sas party mlas that are not running uh, but there are there's a few of them that are are still going to be running, and in the seats where incumbents, long term incumbents, are not running in Saskatoon, there are constituencies that are are typically kind of long term Saskatchewan party uh, seats and, and neighborhoods that would certainly lean a bit more to the right. Um, so yeah, I, I mean that's why the NDP and their leader Carla Beck, she's basically going back and forth from a moose shot to PA with some, some stops in, in Saskatoon, but the two party leaders have not been in Regina that much during this campaign. And as it's, as it's gone on, which w- would lead me to believe that, uh, that the NDP feels pretty comfortable here. Uh, and that maybe Premier Scott Moe knows it's, it's, uh, it's not worth too much of an effort to, to uh, hang on to some seats here. The only the, the only party that we haven't mentioned in this interview so far is the Saskatchewan United Party, the SUP. Now they do have one seat in the legislature, Nadine Wellwood, who is the, who was their president or their uh, leader, and then now Jordan, Jordan. I forget how to pronounce his last name, and I apologize right now, Romick. Joe. Romick. Uh, Romick. Yeah. Romick. Um, yeah. Are they going to be a factor in this election, or was was there Lumsden Morston? By election, close uh, squeak potential win there. They're one and done. 
Haven't, they didn't almost win in Lums and Morris in the by election last year. But I, they I think they, they came from they came from second. Yeah, they they placed in second. You're right. Yeah, they they got in front of the NDP. Uh, uh, Blaine McLeod for the SAS party. He he had 51 percent of the vote. Yeah. So, um, they they're not going to be competitive in, in 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 terms of um like I think provincially, I'm hearing that they're polling total at about two percent, maybe three percent. Um, but but their influence has been felt in, in some ways. Um, I, the the SAS party, I think they've been they've been aware of them uh, of the SAS United and some of the policies that they that they support or or what what their supporters might uh, lean a bit more towards. So and that's come up a little bit in this campaign. But um, yeah, Nadine Wilson in in Saskatchewan Rivers. She was a former SAS Party MLA and got bounced out of that caucus and joined SAS United. Uh, I don't think she's going to win. My parents, actually, they, they live in that constituency up, up in Lake Country. Um, the SAS Party has a very good candidate up there. Uh, his, his name is Eric Schmaltz. Fantastic. He's the, he's the reeve, reeve, of the RM, reeve of the RM of Prince Albert. He's a former Mountie. Uh, he's terrific. He'll definitely be in cabinet in this next term, I think, if, if he's elected. So, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, ultimately they're not going to have a huge vote percentage or total vote count, but their influence has has been felt a bit in the campaign. And I appreciate you correcting me. It was Nadine Wilson, not Nadine Wellwood. That's someone else that I was thinking of, and I apologize I don't for that. Know who Nadine Wellwood is, so yeah, that's good. <laughs> there that's you go. Okay. Um, okay. I want to talk about the other person who uh, casts a long shadow, and he was mentioned numerous times at the beginning of the campaign and during the debate, and that is our current Prime Minister of Canada. Scott Moe has tried to make this campaign about him as well, Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada. Did he successfully pull off the ability to say, if you don't elect us, you're going to have someone who's going to be just in the pocket of Justin Trudeau, because that was the attack that he tried to use against Carla Beck during the campaign. And do residents of Saskatchewan, I know knowing the answer already, because I've spoken to a few during the campaign, did Scott Moe successfully tie Carla Beck to the, uh, the prime minister? That's a good question. And, and I, and I personally do wonder if that, if that has succeeded, Chris, um, to to her credit and to their party's credit, the NDP has really tried their best to separate themselves in the last couple of years since Beck has been the leader, to separate themselves from the from the federal NDP and Jagmeet Singh, and and their relationship with with the Trudeau Liberals over the last few years. Um, whether or not that has been successful in terms of uh, people in Saskatchewan really believing that that the NDP does not support the carbon tax when just a few years ago they did. Their previous leader, Ryan Miley, he loved any kind of carbon tax. He was on video and on record saying that many, many times. Um, we, you know, and particularly the the federal, uh, the federal NDP, their position on the carbon tax. Um, I don't know. I, I'd imagine that there's still some people out there that, that are skeptical. Uh, that the NDP has really changed its tune. Um, but just coming back to 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 the Prime Minister and Scott Moe, I mean, I think at this point, after s- almost seven years of Scott Moe being Premier, I think for most people, it's kind of built in um, that that this guy has spent his his entire time as being Premier defending Saskatchewan from some of the really damaging policies of the, of the Trudeau federal government. And, and, and of course, at the top of that list is the carbon tax. Um, in addition to Bill, Bill C-59 and a series of other uh, really boneheaded and uh, stupid federal policies that make, make things difficult in Saskatchewan. Um, so I, I think that's built in. And I think anybody, um, you know, who thinks of Scott Moe, they would probably... They, they would associate him with Justin Trudeau and not being a big fan. 
looking to the, the sort of the election night, if you will, because I am cautious of time and you're a busy man. So yep. I have two questions left for you. And that is, what are you watching on election night? What will you be watching for to see if the Saskatchewan party does pull out a fourth term victory for uh, Scott Moe or a seven repeat for the Saskatchewan party or changes in the air and the Saskatchewan NDP finally do become government? What areas and are you specifically looking at? I'd say I'm looking in Regina. If the if the Saskatchewan party can hold on to three seats here, or even more, I think that is the sign that uh, it'll actually be quite a good night for the party. Um, because I, I really think they're all they're only that they've only secured really one seat in Regina. Like they're they're safe in one seat, but if they can uh, hold three or, or four, even that would be i think really really impressive um uh, same in saskatoon um as i said they the sas party has incumbents there that that are quite strong uh so if, if they can hang on to four or even five constituencies uh that puts them in in a really really solid uh position for total seat count uh and if they can pick up or hang on to one of the prince albert seats i think both of them are, are, are kind of uh, I think they're they're leaning uh, definitely towards the NDP right now, but I know that, like, as I said, the, the Scott Mo he's been up there a lot. I know that the South Party campaign they've sent a lot of uh, personnel up there, bodies on the ground for door knocking and trying to get out the vote in uh, in, in those two constituencies. So um, I think if if the South Party can get thirty seven seats and above. And particularly if they hit 40 seats on election night, I think they'll come away from the election feeling very, very happy. Um, and I, I think Scott Moe will feel quite pleased with that. Uh, for the NDP, kind of, you know, the the reverse, if they can get above the 24 seat mark, they have 14 right now. If they pick up 10 or more seats, I think they'll be I think they'll be happy. If they can get more than that, I think they'll be very happy. Yeah. Um, and if they can pick off uh, constituencies that might be, you know, like a few of those ones in Saskatoon that I was mentioning, uh, like Saskatoon, uh, Ch uh, Chief Mr. Wasis, that's one of the seats, Saskatoon Southeast or Saskatoon Stonebridge. If they can grab any of those, they'll be really, really pleased. Um, you know, besides obviously the fact that they, they want to win the election, uh, but the map, it, it's just, it, it is challenging for them. Uh, but also for the NDP, as, as I mentioned, I, I do wonder how many constituencies that they'll finish in third. There's a few in the southern part of the province here that uh, could could be challenging for them, where the Saskatchewan will likely get second, but uh, I, I guess we'll see. But that's what I'm looking for on Monday. I hate to ask the prediction, but do you have a prediction already in place or are you letting the voters decide? On this one, Chris, I, 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 I've been advising my clients on, on what I think that the outcome is. I'm going to, uh, uh, I'll, I will reserve my, my prediction on, on your podcast. Although, um, you know, somewhere in the mid to higher thirties for the Saskatchewan party and, kind of mid twenties for the NDP could, could, I think could be a likelihood. Would turnout's going to be a key priority for this election. If turnout's high, that bodes well. If it's turnout's low, then who knows what's going to happen because turnout's always the name of the game. Um, Dale, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me. I, I know I took up a little bit more time than anticipated, but I truly appreciate you taking time to sit down with me and talk about this. Uh, we might be doing this a little bit after the campaign and after the election is unfolded and finally hear your final thoughts on what actually transpired over the last 20, well, eight days after the election is done. Sounds great, Chris. Thank, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on the show. Great to see you. Uh, also, just want to remind you that the link to subscribe to the scoop.ca is in the show notes. So if you listen to this on audio, head over down and scroll down and you can click on it. Scroll, subscribe. It's very easy. All you have to do is put in your email address. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, just scroll down and it's the first link that you'll see. So uh, we'll be right back after a quick message, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Municipal Affairs. 
This is our last episode of the Saskatchewan Votes 2024 series before our all-important election night special where we will be broadcasting live in partnership with the Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities Association from their headquarters in downtown Regina. Tune in at 7.30 Central Standard Time, 9.30 Eastern Standard Time, as we break down this election from a municipal standpoint. What did municipalities hear? What are they looking for from the next provincial government? We will be answering those questions and so much more with mayors, councillors, and stakeholders from across the province live only on YouTube. So stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you Monday night live on Municipal Affairs. Till then. Mm-hmm.